This is part two of the Read 4C Vice Rebuild series. If you haven't seen part one, click the link at the top of the screen. In this video, we will be disassembling the vice and then doing a little bit of cleaning. Hello everyone, I'm Jeff and welcome to my shop. We got a lot to cover, so let's get to it. The first thing we're going to do is remove the dynamic jaw. To do that, we have to open the vise all the way up. Now this vise is really heavy and the dynamic jaw and slide itself is probably about 90 pounds. So this will take a few minutes, but we'll speed up the footage. I'm using some boards to place under it so that it doesn't lean forward. And then I keep sliding it back and then cranking that handle open. And once we've got it open all the way, and I'm just reaching back there to make sure that the lead screw is cleared, the main vice nut, and then we should be able to slide it out. And there we go. Set that down. All right, so to disassemble the dynamic jaw, we need to remove the lock screw that is used to tension up the split nut. So the split nut works to remove slop out of the spindle. And once you've got the slop adjusted, then you put that lock screw in there and then you tighten it down, but you'll have to back it off a little bit. Anyways, once we've got that out, then we're going to go ahead and remove the split nut. So we're just tapping it to get it spinning. It's got little cutouts in it that you can get a punch on there or a flat tip screwdriver if you don't have a punch. And we're just unscrewing it basically out of the vise. And then it'll get to the point where we can manipulate it with our fingers. We can pull out on the spindle a little bit and that'll give us a little more room to work with. And then once it comes out, it'll be in two pieces. There you go. So that's formed as one piece and then they break it in half intentionally so that you can fit it over the end of the spindle. So now we can pull the spindle screw out of the dynamic jaw. We'll set that aside. At some point, Reed introduced a uh, spacer washer that goes on the inside of this opening. And I don't know if this vise had one, but I think what we've got here, which is two shims and a thrust bearing, but I think this was put in there by uh, Jordan. So if you're doing this to a reed vise, you may or may not have a washer in there. And the washer definitely makes sense. It cuts down on the wear and tear of the cast iron on the inside. All right, so I'm just using a little bit of WD-40 to uh, loosen up these pins that hold the pipe jaws in the dynamic jaw. So we'll go ahead and remove the two screws that hold this jaw insert in the dynamic jaw. And these are just rectangular jaw inserts. The C-Series never got a T-shaped insert. like you may see on the S series or the N series or on some Colombian and other brand. And sometime around 1959 to 1962, the C series got replaceable jaw inserts. So when I'm disassembling stuff that has similar parts, I like to index those parts so that when I reassemble it, I know where everything goes. So the, the jaw insert for the dynamic or the static jaw are probably exactly the same, but I'm going to go ahead and index them regardless. So I'm just using a spring-loaded punch here to create some index marks. 
And then I'll index the jaw insert. And I'm going to do this on the static jaw side as well. So I'm putting two dots on this jaw and on the insert. And then on the dynamics or the static side, I'll do three dots. That way I don't get them mixed up. So the pipe jaw inserts actually have a little bit of play on each side of them, about an eighth of an inch. And if they're not perfectly level, those pins don't want to drive out of them very well. And you'll see just how much of a pain in the butt it is for me to get these pins out. So there's nothing else holding the pens in there but friction. But I'm using a, a brass punch and my brass tip hammer, and I'm just driving those pens. And as they start to come out the bottom, I've got to put more boards under this jaw to raise it up. But you'll see me stick screwdrivers and punches inside the jaw opening to try to level off that pipe jaw while I'm driving these pins. So once we've got them pretty much out, you can see them hanging down there and we'll go ahead and just knock them out. And that pipe jaw insert will just come out as well. Now, this one's broken off on the end right there. I didn't do that. It was this way when I got it. But it's still completely serviceable. So let's look at closer at the spindle. It is 25 and a half inches long from end to end. And the diameter of the spindle is one and one quarters of an inch. Okay, so here we are at the static jaw side. And again, we'll just remove the two screws that hold the jaw insert on. And then we'll loosen it up with that hammer. Get it off of there. And then we're going to index these as well. Notice that I'm putting the index mark on the back side, so you'll never see it, but it's also at the top of the jaw. So that when I put these back on, I will have them back on the vise exactly like they were when I took them off. And we're just indexing the Dynamic jaw now with those three dots. So now we're going to remove the swivel lock nuts. And there are two on this vise. And older vices, not the 4C series, not the C series, but like the R series, for instance, may only have one on one side. And that was changed in 1950 when they started putting two on all of the vices. So that helps us in identifying a vice by a year somewhat. There's a lot of things that we're going to talk about that help you identify this vice and what year it is. So once we've got that done... Then there is the center bolt on the bottom. One of the locks just came out that opening on the bottom. That's how you actually get them in and out of that uh, swivel base. But I don't have a screwdriver big enough to get this bolt loose. So I'm just using a uh, flat bar. And once we get it broken loose, it'll turn out of there pretty easily. There we go. So now it'll spin. 
Still got a good amount of pressure on it because I don't have the, uh, the static part of the vise supported right now. I'll put a block of wood under that end and that'll help that off of there. So once that bolt is out of there, the swivel base will come right off. A big bolt. There's your swivel base. It's still got one of the locks inside it. So that lock, you just slide it around till you get to that square opening on the bottom or rectangular opening and it'll come right out of there. Here you can see the teeth on the inside of the swivel base and you can see the teeth on the lock and they engage with those teeth. That's what happens when you tighten down those swivel locks. So Jordan had uh, installed two bushings inside these mounting holes for smaller screws. So I'm just knocking those bushings out of there. And now we're going to shoot some WD-40 in there. And you can kind of see here that gap I was talking about, about an eighth of an inch on each side of the pipe jaw insert. And you can also see the main vice nut inside that large opening. That's the heart of a vice. Those are usually cast iron or hardened steel. So normally there's just a roll pin or a metal rod that is in a hole in the base that sticks up. And that's what keeps that main nut inside the vise. I think this is just another Jordan upgrade that he did to this vise. It's actually pretty smart. It's still got a roll pin there, but uh, he's added a piece of aluminum to the top of it and a screw to lock it in place. So we'll just tap that roll pin out of the base. I'll move the vise a little bit here so you can see it a little better. And there it is. So sometime between 1970 and 1972, they changed from a roll pin to a uh, hardened steel dowel. So since Jordan has done his work there, that doesn't help us in dating the vice really, but there's your main vice nut. This one is hardened steel, but I have several vices that have cast iron main nuts inside them. So next we'll go ahead and remove the uh, pins that hold in the static jaw pipe jaw inserts. And this went a little easier than on the dynamic side. Got those pins out. We can go ahead and pull out that pipe jaw insert. And this one is not damaged. All right, so now that we've got that completely disassembled, what I like to do is soak everything in simple green for 24 hours. So I've got this big bin and I'm just going to put all the parts in here and then dump a ton of simple green in there. The simple green acts as a degreaser, but it also will remove paint. So a lot of the gray paint that you really can't see on the vise right now, but it's there. A lot of that will come off. And then we'll just fill this up with simple green. I buy these, I think they're two and a half gallon uh, 
jugs of simple green. I get them from like Home Depot. I think they're like 20 bucks a piece. And I like using the simple green because it's non-toxic and it doesn't have a bad odor to it. And it's uh, reusable. So I'll show you how I reclaim it here in a little bit. But that's six of those, or is that eight of the, yeah, eight of those, two and a half gallons. All right, so here we are 24 hours later. I've got a paint filter on in a funnel, and I'm just using a small battery-powered siphon. I'm sucking that simple green out of the bin and back into the containers, and it's running through that strainer. And I don't remember the micron size of that strainer, but it's a paint strainer like you use for automotive paint. And that cuts down on the amount of debris that stays in my simple green. But I do this for just about everything that I work on. So once we've recovered all of this simple green, then we're going to pull each one of these parts out and we're going to take them over to the sink and rinse them off and scrub them down with a wire brush and that'll remove any of the uh, remaining paint or at least most of the remaining paint. And you'll, you can kind of tell on the base on like the edge of the base there for the static jaw that the paint that's on there is kind of bubbled up. That's what the simple green will do. That stuff will just slough right off of there with the, uh, with the water when we rinse it off. And if it doesn't scrubbing it with that wire brush will definitely get it gone. So nothing real exciting about any of this, but this is my process, but you can see the gray paint on there now because uh, the color really pops once you've got all the grit off of that. So the next process that we're going to do is soaking all of these parts in citric acid. And in fact, the only parts that I'm not going to soak in the citric acid are those shims and that thrust bearing because they're stainless and they don't, they don't have any rust on them. So there's no reason to soak them in the citric acid, but the citric acid will remove the rust or at least most of it. If you've used um, evapo rust or similar products, Citric acid basically does the same thing, and it does it for a hell of a lot cheaper. So in a little bit here, you'll see there's that big bag of citric acid that I've got. I think I paid, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks for that bag. And I use just a little tablespoon scoop per gallon of water. And then I'm going to let this stuff soak for 24 hours again. So we'll go ahead and... Start the water going, mix up that a little bit, and then start putting the parts in there. Now, notice I'm doing this outside now, and that's because the only real downfall to citric acid is it smells like rotten eggs once it starts working. So you're going to want to do that outside. But we'll let that fill up, and then we're going to let that sit for 24 hours. And here we are the next day, and we're going to pull each one of those parts out, rinse them off, and then bring them in here to the table and towel dry them. So those are all the screws and stuff, 
And I'm just coating them with the WD-40 so that they won't rust again. Now, all of this cast iron stuff, it'll rust real fast. So you want to get it towel dry. And I've even got a little blower there, a little electric blower that I use to get inside the areas that I can't get with the towel. You want to get as much water off of this as you can, as fast as you can. That's why I do this one piece at a time. And then we'll set that to the side. So we're going to clean these items up again with a wire brush on my angle grinder a little bit later, but uh, this is how we want them for the time being. So anything that uh, that's going to get paint, you don't want to coat in the WD-40. And the WD-40 is just a, uh, a temporary solution. If you put WD-40 on metal, eventually it will rust because WD-40 has water in it. But um, for the time being, the WD-40 does what it needs to do. So all of the cast iron parts... We're not going to paint. I'm not going to paint this vise. I'm going to leave it raw, but I am going to coat it with something uh, once we get back closer to, to the assembly stage. So I don't want to put WD-40 on the cast iron because then I'm just going to have to soak it in simple green again to get the WD-40 off of it. So 99% of this stuff is not going to get coated with the WD-40. Just those small little bolts that we had and screws, and then the jaw inserts. The other thing, if you are going to paint it, um, make sure you're using some rags or towels that are lint free when you do this because that cast iron it's got that rough texture to it and you'll have lint all over the cast iron and if you go to paint you'll definitely see that lint so uh, just use a lint free rag or towel if you're going to be painting I think this is the last of it. Nope, we still got the jaws after this. So I think a lot of these parts here, we are going to go ahead and coat with the WD-40. My mistake. So we've got the two locks. We've got the two swivel lock nuts. And we've got the four pins that hold the pipe jaws in. And the split nut. We'll still clean those up probably on the uh, wire wheel on the grinder, but we'll go ahead and put WD-40 on them for now. So here we are with the jaws and that center uh, bolt. We'll coat that, I think, with the WD-40 as well, All all this stuff here. Then we'll set all of that aside. So next, we're going to look at some of the stampings that are on these pieces now that they're pretty well cleaned up. Here we can see an EC, and that's probably just a casting stamp. But on this side, and on all four C's, it should be on this side, you have a date stamp. That's 1281. 
So December of 1981 is when this jaw or when this vice was made. And that's not the only date stamp. There's two of them. There's one on the dynamic jaw as well. I'm just making sure there's not another stamping on the bottom, which there is not. And these stampings can be real faint. Like I couldn't even see those before we clean this up. So cleaning it up really helps. So on this side of the dynamic jaw, you will see that here we have the date stamp again, 12 of 81. But you can see how faint the, the 12 is. And it's on there twice even. And then that's the only stampings on the dynamic jaw. Some jaws will have it on both sides of the jaw. Depending on what vice you're, you're working on, if it's an R series, and depending on what year, it may have it on both sides. Cleaned up pretty good. So here we are with the base. And it has two stampings on it. This one just says 6 4C. And then this one says uh, EC again. So that's another casting indicator, probably. And then I just wanted to look at the. Uh, the main nut to make sure it didn't have any uh, on there as well, which it doesn't. So that's going to wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. I'll answer them as fast as I can get to them. And as always, I will see you next time.